Hello everyone, I hope you're well playing on and making the games that you all love. You're joining me, your host, Max Pears, but not just me, we have an incredible guest joining us from the other side of the world. We've got the fantastic Jason Lee, Chief Creative Officer over at Pixelmatic. Jason, thank you for joining me on today's show. It's a pleasure, Max. I'm excited to be here. May I'm absolutely excited to have you here as well. This is, you know, an exciting one for not just me, but obviously the people listening. You've been in the games industry for, you know, many years, worked on incredible different titles, and currently working on a very, very cool title right now, which is known as Infinite Fleet. Do you want to talk a bit about yourself first and how you got into games before we, we, we talk more about Infinite Fleet? Sure. Yeah. Um, yeah. Like, um, thank you for the introduction. That was awesome. Uh, yeah, I'm the chief creative officer at Pixelmatic. So, you know, I basically drive the creative vision forward and uh, work very close with the design team to help sculpt the gameplay experience and deliver on that creative vision. Um, before joining Pixelmatic, I worked at Relic Entertainment um, as the design lead on various franchises like Company of Heroes and Age of Empires. Um, and for people that might not know about Pixelmatic, um, it, it's, it's a game development studio. It's based out in Shanghai. Um, we have distributed teams all around the world. So this, the studio is driven really by creative and technical leads that brought their experiences from AAA game studios like Relic Entertainment, Ubisoft, BioWare, and Bandai Namco. Uh, and those are just a list of few. <laughs> Um, yeah, and talking a bit about Infinite Fleet, um, it's a, Infinite Fleet's a sci-fi MMO strategy game uh, where the player commands a fleet of battle fortresses to fight off the enemy invasion and explore the deepest areas of space. Um, there's strategy, there's lots of customization, um, mining on asteroids, colonizing planets, and lots and lots to explore and to do everything you want to see in a sci-fi space game. And some unique standout elements of Infinite Fleet is how we tell the narrative. And yeah, the narrative is player driven. So the major arcs that turn decision points of the story are really driven by the collective player choices and actions. You know, random example is, let's say a meteor is headed for Earth, right? And um, if the players don't destroy it before it hits Earth, like Earth is gone and it doesn't respond, right? So like players will have to live with that experience uh, and the world, you know, after the fact that now that the Earth is gone, right? <laughs> um, yeah, and we also write the players into the story um, that achieved something grand and, or unique. So another example of that is like if uh, you were exploring, let's say you were exploring Max and you found a wrecked alien spacecraft, right? You put it back and through research, um, you know, it, it, into the craft, like it, it led to unlocking some new technology for humanity, right? And you would forever be remembered in the story as the guy that discovered that technology. Within wow. Our world. Pretty cool, right? That's yeah. awesome. Yeah, and the way we create this experience and ultra rare, but you know, make it feel extremely grand is by tying everything, like tying in the sense of exploration and discovery in a gigantic universe we sort of procedurally generate. Right? Oh, wow, even more. So, so procedurally yeah. generate, like you got even more to show the player than with, with right, that. Right, exactly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And so really on a meta level, on a, on a very high meta level, the game will literally feel like playing Risk on the scale of the universe together with tens of thousands of other players all working together for the same goal. But first, a quick word from our sponsor. Today's sponsor is the incredible developers over at GameTextures.com. For those of you who do not know who these incredible developers are, let me tell you a bit about them and their project. Their goal is to create incredible texture libraries for you as developers from all stages of production, 
whether that means early prototyping to the finished product. They have a range of different textures for you to download and use in your projects. Not only this, but they really emphasize the fact that it is from developers for developers. So they have a range of different art styles, again, to try fit those needs on multiple platforms from Unreal with their focused materials to Unity and Blender. All of these are available for you if you join through one of their subscriptions. They have 30 free materials available now at no extra cost if you register and download them, which is in the link down below. You have a ton of different tiers to select from. From hobbyist freelancers to full-time dev, they have you covered not only in terms of materials, stage, but price range as well. And for level designs, this is really important. You've heard me say it before about getting your color coding correct. So if you want to increase the different range of materials to help sell your prototypes or full game in development, then please subscribe and you will also get a 10% discount off their subscription when you use the coupon code LEVEL99 at checkout. Join them now, grab a ton of cool materials and help make your levels and environments pop. All right, back to the show. <laughs> Wow, man, that like sounds, you know, honestly incredible. And just like, just even just from what you said there, there must be so much thought into this. And I want to ask that you talk about like the narrative and designing the players at the forefront, not only in the impact of the story, but as you said, like crafting them into the the world for discovering in the example you gave, what kind of led you to that kind of design choice there? Because we've seen different MMOs try to tackle story in different ways. So what kind of led you all in that direction? Everything core to Infinite Fleet is um, like the, the, the concept of player driven, right? Uh, from our economy to our narrative. Um, and uh, we wanted the players to feel like the hero. Like when you play games like World of Warcraft, or these other, you, you hear about the legend of these heroes like Thrall and, um, you know, Anduin, like Anduin and, you know, like these people that have done grand things. And you're really sort of living and experiencing the world of Warcraft as a vessel, right? As who you are. But, um, you know, they call you hero, but are you really, right? They're, they're these gigantic, these legendary heroes. And like, you, you, you sort of fantasize about, well, why can't I be that guy, right? <laughs> right? And so we wanted the players to be that character and not just a one of the pawns, right? That sort of helped assist those big legendary heroes sort of overcome these obstacles. And, and that's why, you know, we really want to lean on this direction. No, man, I think that's a fantastic direction. And like you said, just, I mean, honestly, it's just super smart. So I just think that's such a fantastic way to tie that in. You mentioned there a bit about the economy. A lot of people, I don't think, realize the importance when, you know, when we're creating believable worlds and especially worlds that, you know, you feel you have an impact in and you to earn money. We always have an economy. Can you explain a bit to maybe some listeners who don't understand like economy design and kind of what that, that entails? Yeah. Um, economy design is actually quite complex. Like economy is sort of a, almost in, in some ways, it's like the unsung hero in the game where if it's great and um, if it works very well, um, it, it provides a lot of excitement and motivation and uh, things in the game without, you know, it you noticing that, you know, there's this really great economy, right? Uh, you know, it, it makes everything else better because of the great economy, right? It's, it's almost like the engine that's running behind of everything, right? Yeah. So to create a great economy, it's really like you have to really understand the sense of, um, you know, where, like how, how you want that flow of player motivation to, to run, right? And, and uh, you create so you, you, a lot of the elements of creating a great economy is not how you, I guess, like the, the, the points in which you create it, but it's, it's about how you tune things. Um, so, um, you know, what, what, parts of economy are a bit more loose and more there's more variability to things and what parts are more fixed and, and that's really the i that's that's a topic 
even beyond the economy that I kind of wanted to touch on a bit um, a, a, from a game as a whole and even in level design, right? For maybe some of your listeners that are um, like students that are sort of trying to study more about level design and stuff and how you create more impact in certain specific points and levels, right? And um, having using the concept of variable, right, um, is a very powerful tool, right? Um, not just in just game design as a whole, but even in, um, you know, level design, right? And um, what I mean by variables is, um, so when you look at a leveling system, for example, you see in a lot of games, right? Um, they, they are a system based on fixed, um, ver- fixed systems. So it's like, you know exactly when you're going to get to level two or level three. You have the, that experience bar that tells you when that's going to happen and so on, right? Um, and, and the motivation that sort of creates is that um, it, 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 it's like, okay, well, I have, I, I, as long as I put in this much of effort, um, you know, then I'm going to progress to that next level. I'm going to gain this much power and I'm going to unlock these abilities. So it, it creates that psychological thing for the player where it's like, um, when they get near that threshold, you know, it, it sort of, they want to play a bit more, right? So, you know, you often hear like, okay, I'll play until level, level, I, I hit level three or level four, right? You know, because I'm only like a, an hour, hour left or, or like 30 minutes left or whatever, right? Um, and then you have the element of variability. So like, you can't do that. You can't do create a leveling system or you can, but it creates, it, it becomes too random, right? If it's a variable, like you, like it, you can, some players may, might, if you do it with a variable system, some players may get to level two in one second, right? Um, maybe kill one monster and then they get to level, I don't know, like level two. And then some other player might have to kill 10 monsters to get to level two. And it's not fair, right? Between different characters, right? But how do you use variability in an impactful way? An example is, um, you, when you see um, war, like those kind of like uh, random mobs that sort of spawn in, in areas um, between the ranges of two, let's say like 30 minutes to let's say four hour. And this random mob may, if you kill it, it might, it has a high chance of dropping something grand, right? So that's a variable aspect because it makes you focus and pay attention to a certain area, right? Because it's holding um, some something that is um, that could be very valuable, right? So it, understanding that like it, it sort of draws attention, like you can use that in levels, right? Um, how, how do you, if you really want people to focus on a certain element or certain part of your level, um, instead of just glossing it over, like, you know, play around with variability, you know, in, in those levels and, and see, see, you know, the result of it, right? Now, when we talk about variables too, um, you know, there is something important to keep in mind. Adding variables just for the sake of variables is also, pro- you know, it can create sort of not the most positive response, right? Because it's like, you're making me focus, like as a player, you're making me, pay attention and focus on something that, you know, just for the sake of it, there's no reason to it, right? <laughs> um, then, then it gets annoying. So, you know, you want to try to tie that into something that's um, that has a reason, uh, tied into a narrative or some uh, important core gameplay element of it. Um, and then, you know, then it becomes a very powerful mechanic. No, that's, I mean, such some great points you said, especially about like tying into the core of mechanic there do you think that there's like anything else to consider like you say tying in the core there don't overuse it is there anything else that you think like really helps like especially you know aspiring ld should keep in mind when they are playing around with kind of variables in their levels yeah so um let's see so i mean variables it is more general. I mean, it's, it, it can be, uh, you know, I mean, it really depends on how you execute it. Like, um, let's think, so thinking about a game, let's say, well, let's, let's say there's a puzzle in a game, like, or, or let's play, you're playing like Laurel Craft, um, you know, where you're trying to raid a dungeon or something like that, right? And then you encounter a, a section where there's, a, it's like one of those tile stepping puzzles where if you step on one tile and let's say all the tiles around it sort of jiggle around in different colors 
and you have to, let's say, try to stay on the same color tile, right? And all the way through it or else everything falls apart and you die, right? <laughs> I think that's part of the level, for example. Um, so if the uh, sort of formula for what tiles get unlocked um, is stays the same every single time, then that puzzle doesn't become replayable, right? And, but um, if it changes based on like every time, let's say like next time I play, I step on the, that blue tile that's, that's right in front. As soon as I, I walk onto this tile puzzle, um, if that sort of rotational sort of variable in, in how, what gets unlocked change, it, it changes every single time. Right. Then, then, you know, it makes me think about what, like figure out what the pattern is. There's a different pattern every single time. Right. So that, that, that creates its own game within the game, um, which is interesting, right? Um, and it makes me pay attention to this puzzle instead of, I finished it once, so now I know it works, <laughs> how it works, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. But outside the whole variable element of it, you know, there are other things obviously important to level design. I, I'm sure like maybe some of uh, your listeners already know, but it's sort of the concept of, and this is something that's very important in RTS games in general. Um, and I'm sure maybe in shooters as well, but the concept of sort of um, enclosed and open spaces and how you how that plays a important you know element when you create levels, right? Um, I mean, enclosed spaces uh, obviously create that more that feeling of safety, right? Um, and, and then open areas uh, create more of that sense of danger, right? Um, so you always want to try to align your level design ways in which is, if it's too enclosed, then it's um, you know it, it's not as interesting, right? Because you want to force the players into danger zones, um, and then also if it's too open, it, that's also not good because they, they have to um, players will always try to seek cover, right? So you're trying to go from one area to another of cover, so in between can be open. So the, like the, the spaces and how arrange things, um, uh, it's a psychological thing. I think that um, you know players like level designers should all also think about in, when they align and create these levels. Yeah, man, and I think that's a great point. Like, say so, so we're trying to communicate again with players subconsciously to make them feel certain ways, as you said, whether that be through indoors feeling safety or make them feel small and weak or whatever the theme may be of those levels. And I wanted, I don't know if you can talk too much about it, mate, with infinite fleet, but because, you know, you're in, you're in space, you've all this so much to explore, I guess how, again, how have you found that trying to communicate and work on those subconscious levels with players? Yeah. So um, in Infinite Fleet, um, you know, some of the, it, it is, it's, it's, it's the space, right? <laughs> I mean, what, we like, don't have a lot of cover there, right? Um, but, you know, we use things like, uh, we use like planets, right? Uh, we use asteroids, um, you know, all that kind of stuff to use as, you know, shot blocking, um, also as um, vision blocking objects, um, you know, to, to, to a certain, because when you're in space and fighting with big, space cars you're fighting from like really long ranges right so even small amount of an asteroid bell uh plays a big role <laughs> you know as a as a sort of a cover or shot blocking object right um, um also you're fighting not just in a small sector of space like you're really fighting across an entire space around let's say a planet even right so you know a, a planet is also another big sort of uh, shot blocking object and, and a vision blocking object in, in a certain sense, right? So you can really just rotate and, and, and it might take you a while, but, you know, uh, flank around the planet um, or a gigantic asteroid that might be there um, and, and then use that as, um, you know, the sort of the level design aspect of things, right? Um, in how you write. But the unique thing about our thing is it's not just about those kind of elements that we use to confine and use space. But we have, um, the cool thing is like, you know, there's a lot of things in space where it's like, you know, there's like gra in interesting ways in which we can really screw around with the players in terms of how they control their ships using different gravitational um, um, rules uh, based on how close they are to a, a certain type of planet and not. Um, 
We can also play around with like, you know, solar flares and all that kind of stuff if they're very close to a star um, and how they, that just sort of adds a whole new variable and things that they weren't expecting, um, you know, in, in that game space, right? Um, the thing is like, we can really add a lot of interesting variables to our level design because our game is not, at least right now, it's not multiplayer. It's, it's co-ops uh, uh, campaign single player. So, um, you know, um, in multiplayer games, you want the levels and you want um, a lot of the kits that, that's available to the player to be um, fixed. Uh, so things that the player, that doesn't change on the player, right? Because it, it's a frustrating thing when you know when um, you, you preemptively um, sort of calculate it and, and know and you prepared perfectly what, what the enemy is going to do and you executed everything properly, but just out of random luck, something happened in the middle, uh, in, the, in the level and you, you sort of lost that outcome. That, that's a very frustrating thing in multiplayer, right? But in single player, that's actually part of engagement. Right, um, because you're not supposed to know exactly, like you're not supposed to preemptively, you know, uh, guess what the um, AI is going to do, right? And we don't want that, obviously, right? You're supposed it's all, all about reaction, right, and, and being able to act off what you see, right? So, um, yeah, we have a lot more leeway in ter- terms of you know creating those interesting um, rules within our levels. Um, uh, to make th- those kind of uh, interesting uh, exper- experiences. Yeah, no, man, like, it sounds so, like even just some of the examples you gave there, like solar flares, gravitational pull, there's still a lot that you can, as you said, just play around with, which I think is always so exciting. And I want to ask, mate, w- with your position, you know, as, as, as creative chief, there must be a whole lot for you to kind of consider when working with your incredible teammates and that, and especially across multiple studios. How hard is it for you to like keep track of everything and keep that kind of unified design vision when, when, when working on a project so big like this as well? Right, right. Um, yeah, like, I mean, it, it, it is a challenge, right? Uh, but I have, you know, uh, the, the thing is like, um, if you have a great team behind you, right, uh, you know, it, it makes that easier. Um, and we do, right? Um, we have a, uh, like from, there's very little, we need to worry about in terms of like art and art and how, how art and, um, you know, VFX and sound is going to sort of execute on that because, you know, our art uh, director of art is, you know, he's solid. Like, you know, he came with me from um, Relic Entertainment. So he has a crap ton of experience. Um, I think more than me in the industry. Um, so yeah, well, like we have a solid, team around us in the, like in the leadership area so you know they they are very good at like um sort of spreading the gospel like like you know <laughs> sort of spreading that message of, and the vision across the entire team and making sure that stays core and solid and doesn't change so if it wasn't for them yeah it would have been it is very it would be very difficult uh because you know it's um with with all the new systems and new people coming onto the team, um, you know, it's like reiterating the same message over and over again. <laughs> yeah. Um, but yeah, like having them there uh, makes it very easy. At Lover Design Lobby, we believe everybody has a story to tell. Hobbyist or student, freelancer or veteran, we made it our mission to unite those who share our passion for creating and developing great games. Thanks to our generous Patreon backers, we've been able to do just that. So if you've already pledged your support, thank you. If not, you too can ensure the future of Level Design Lobby, helping us to create even more exciting content, collaborations, interviews, and much more. With awesome perks and rewards, whether you're a seasoned professional or just getting started, you're sure to find something for you. Want to share tips, tricks, and advice with passionate, like-minded developers? Our awesome community Discord has you covered. Fancy practicing your level design, creating strong portfolio content, and having fun? Then try our level design weekends. Or perhaps you want to individually discuss your work, hone your skills, or level up your career? Then consider our one-on-one mentorships. If you share our vision, then go to patreon.com forward slash level design lobby for more information and to pledge your support. Thank you. 
That's great to hear, man. Yeah, because like I said, there's, you know, we've, we've just spoken about narrative to economy to level design psychology, you know, even just from our small conversation here, which, you know, is great for us to talk about and the listeners. But I don't think they quite understand, like you said, how much of that happens on a day to day basis. And we're only touching base on this right now. So, no, this is all brilliant. And I want to say, like, as you said, you're exploring a lot of the world, or should I say, the universe here. We talked a little bit about there for level design, how to use these mechanics to to make the the combat as well as the levels feel very entertaining. What's it like designing like a, a universe, right? Because that space is so infinite. There's so much to see. Is there any inspirations you took from or things that you are considering when designing for such a huge world? Um, yeah, it's definitely overwhelming. Um if you think about like, wow, like the, the scope of everything, um, I don't think our procedural generation, so we have to create rules within a procedural generation system to obviously, like, obviously we can't have stars spawn within a star and, you know, that, like things like that. Right. Yeah. Um, so we have to create these kind of rules. And, um, you know, when I look at sort of the rule sets that we have so far, it's only a fraction of uh, all, all the things that we want to explore, right? Um, uh, and the thing is, like, yeah, it, I think looking back at it, maybe, you know, a year from now when we, you know, review and look at our universe, I'm like, how do we, I'm pretty sure I would end up looking back and be like, how do we get to here? But, like, I don't really want to think that far ahead, <laughs> Um, yeah, I, I, I'm, we're really looking at it in chunks and in, in things in which that, you know, that we can see so far and creating a um, few basic level th- things within the universe that, you know, we want to create things around and then continuously sort of add those kind of rules, um, even even go as far as like adding procedural generation to like, you know, planets even as well. Right. Um, in terms of biomes and you know, like what it is, uh, what type of biome it has. And based on the biome, like what can you, um, what type of resources can you mine from that, right? Um, getting into that level of finite detail, right? And um, so, yeah, if you get into that, it, it gets crazy. That's why, like, we know where we kind of want to get into. And we it's just tons of conversations that we we sort of have around uh, the, these kind of rule sets and how, how we want to create this grand universe. Um, but... When, when we look at every conversation we have, it's like, um, and, and then think about how we're going to execute on all this. Like if we say, let's do this all together, then yeah, it becomes extremely overwhelming, but we take it step by step. And we, we, under, we use that as a directional guide as this is where we want to get to. Um, but these are the things that are important and let's start here and expand. Yeah. So like when you're setting up obviously all these rules for your procedural system, and because compared to like other games where you, you you create a very handcrafted, you know, you know when the player is coming in, this will happen, which will trigger there. Has it been tough for you guys to kind of, I guess, relinquish control to the systems, if that, if that makes sense? I don't, I, I wouldn't say it, it's tough. Um, I think it's a different level of expectation, right? Um, for a craft, so any pro, other projects before that, you know, um, when you create a crafted map, um, you know, there's a game, there's positives and negatives, right? With crafted maps, um, you know, you, you as the designer, like you said, I think this is what you're trying to get to, but you, you, you as a designer has absolute control over, um, the, the, direct experience that you want the player to have because you place things specifically at a certain location for a reason, right? Um, and you, you, you place enemy count, uh, enemy spawn points or, or, you know, spawning markers and stuff like that. Uh, you know, that, that's all like very, very to catered sort of uh, crafted experiences that you want the players to have. Um, with procedural generation, um, we have a mix of that. So not when we say procedural generation, uh, uh, it's, um, we do procedurally generate, uh, stuff, but it's not like, not the whole, everything is procedurally generated. Like uh, there are 
like the key landmarks or the key locations of um, you know things that are important. They're there as anchors and staples of you know what should be there, right? Um, it's just sort of all the stuff in between um, that are not that, like they, they're not the key areas of locations. So if we use um, World of Warcraft, for example, um, you know, like Stormwind Castle would always be Stormwind Castle. It'll be always at the same place yeah. or, or, or Orgrimmar will always be at the same place. It's just sort of, um, and then all the towns in between will more like be around that same location, but it's just like the journey in between and, and all that could be sort of mixed up, right, in, in ways. If you look at Diablo or Path of Exile is a great, um, another a- great ARPG, for example. Um, you know, like you can play that mission and it gets uh, like they're, they're sort of dungeons and they sort of, um, it gets, it gets mixed up and changed every single time, right? That you play. Uh, so it's, it's a procedure generated mission system, like a level system, right? Um, so what we're doing is in some ways kind of similar, but we're also tying in sort of mission objectives and, you know, interesting points of interest and stuff like that along with it. Right. Um, yeah. So, so there, there, are, there is a fixed component to things, um, in areas in which the, I think it's more powerful to have that fixed component, but you know, that, that procedural generation sort of fills, fills in the content for the rest. No, it makes total sense. Yeah, there's a, it's like you said, it's not everything, but like it's a tool to help you work on different aspects, which is just great there, mate. And I wanted to ask, sorry, I'm kind of jumping around with the questions, but I just got so much stuff to ask you and just pick your, pick your brain on, mate. And I just wanted to ask, because you, you've been in the industry for a while, you've worked on many different projects and titles. I guess I'm wondering when it comes to like, level design, designing for different genres, how do you approach and adapt to these kind of different challenges, mate? Like, I think there are things, even across all genres, uh, when you think about level design, they share, right? Um, And then there are things that are more specific uh, to specific types of genres. Uh, That's more important. Because um, it really depends on, um, I guess how much um, the player, like, not just the specific genre, but also the game in how much weight they put on the actual levels to the uh, gameplay aspect of things, right? Um, so, so obviously some genres um, put a lot more weight on the levels because the levels is very core integral to the gameplay. For example, shooters, right? Because with shooters... Um, you know, from the character side of things, there's a very few select uh, number of actions you can partake, like throwing grenades and some, you know, like, um, you know, you point and shoot. Those are all mechanics, right? But those mechanics become actual gameplay uh, based on what you're shooting at within the levels. You know, uh, are you doing it from cover or not? Are you doing it while you're shooting? Are you doing it while you're because you have to duck like so like level design really takes the kit um, that the player has and then sort of like puts it on steroids depending on how um, you know how well the level is crafted right whereas if you look at um, you know RTS um, levels in RTS are also very important but it's much less so compared to um, uh, like a shooter right because um First of all, the angle wise, you know, you mo- mo- most of the time with RTS games, you're looking at it from top down, right? Um, so there's lef- less of that height variation um, that, that is very important in, in RTS games. Uh, but a lot of the focus is on the number of units you're controlling. Uh, so the level itself um, is, you know, the location and, you know, where you're fighting from is, you know, does matter. But there's um, all, there's a lot more emphasis based on the different roles of different different types of units that you're controlling. So it, it, there's in in RTS levels there's less it, it has a less impact uh, in terms of like how much um, that you're, you're you're sort of worried about in in how it's going to affect gameplay, right? 
Um, let's see. Uh, and then you look at games like, like card games, for example, where you know the levels have no nothing, right? It's just a board where you place your cards. So there's no variability at all because there's so much variability in the cards itself. So if you add variability within the the actual, let's say, on the board, where it's like, um, you know, every turn it randomly chooses a number of cards you can play, for example. Um, well, that that's going to, you know, I think players are going to get really frustrated uh, because with card games, there's already too much randomness based on you know what you might draw. <laughs> Right, so like adding another degree of randomness to that degree, um, you know, adds it just basically makes the game into gambling, um, you know, without money. Right, that's really what gambling is when the variability is too great, where you know skill doesn't um, play as big of an impact. And I guess there as well, mate, when you're designing a game huge like Infinite Fleet, I guess as we talked about, a lot of the levels that you design also are based around the the core of the mechanics regardless of, of genre i guess when you're developing like a level like I mean, again i don't know if you can say too much so stop me if, if you can't mate but when you design these levels do you kind of try figure out what mechanics because you say it's player driven there's a lot to explore but do you try plan out what mechanics the players will have kind of at each stage and then kind of build levels around that mate so we yes to some degree um and then there are some like really really um um sort of gameplay changing tech um where that's the kind of stuff that we want to sort of um save uh for players to explore and find right um so yeah i mean i'm not gonna get into what that is yet because you know, <laughs> that's you know, probably fine you know, save that for the grand review but <laughs> yeah. um <laughs> Like, uh, yeah, like, uh, like, you know, it, we have a few select number of these grand level tech where it's like it takes the humanity to sort of like that next level, right? Uh, that next level of, you know, um, it, how they combat or how they maneuver or how they travel, right? And that's the kind of stuff that we want players to sort of find uh, as they explore the universe. Um and um, yeah, and be remembered for the person that found it, or um, yeah, uh, <laughs> so uh, yeah, yeah, man, no, that's awesome. I want to ask as well, mate. And again, I don't know how much you can touch on this one, but because obviously you're you're controlling a ship, and it moves. You know, any spaceship is really incredible to to fly, and it moves different to the how the average person travels day to day to work or something like that. I guess, how do you manage that feel? How how do you focus on making sure that the, the core movement and the space needed for that core movement to, to feel incredible? Right. Um, so our spaceship is not a, like a small spaceship. It's not like a, a fighter. Uh, it's more of like a gigantic battle fortress, like on the scale of... Um, see like like when you see those imperial fleets from star wars like the big ones like it, it's gigantic it's like it's like the size of almost like a quarter of a planet or something <laughs> Damn. but it, it's huge it's it's mm. it's gigantic right so you know they don't they won't have the letter level of finesse and the level of sort of um I guess like roll and stuff like that, that you might see that you're, you know, we're used to seeing from like, you know, um, space jets and stuff like that. Right. Um, so it's, it's not going to be very difficult for the player to control. And, um, you know, with infinite fleet, uh, the focus is more mostly around the, um, gameplay strategy when it comes to actually controlling the ships and moving things around. So in comparison to games like um, that, that try to imitate more of that realistic spaceship um, like movement uh, and, and making it feel that way, that, that's not our, our primary focus, right? Our primary focus is making it easy for players to execute strategy. Now, it doesn't mean that we're, gonna, we're, we're, we're making movement unrealistic in any way, right? Um, it, but it, it's like player convenience uh, to execute strategy comes first. Oh, that's great, mate. Now we're going to have to start wrapping things up. So I want to kind of focus the last couple of questions kind of on you, mate. 
And I guess my first one is, is kind of like what inspired you to get into the, into the industry? What was it that made you choose your career in games? It's, it's probably, it started from my childhood, right? Um, I started playing, I like, um, yeah, I, my, my biggest game sessions, the things that I used to do with my dad a lot when I was a child was we used to fight over our time playing Nintendo, right? <laughs> <laughs> so me and my dad used to play like Zelda together, but obviously Zelda is a one single player game, right? But what, what we do is like, we take turns, right? <laughs> So the, we used to fight over the controller, um, but my dad was like a, a night owl, right? So he would stay up all night and play when I'm asleep. And when I wake up, it's like my turn, right? But there's sometimes there are like times in between where we conflict and that's when we would fight over. <laughs> but it's through that process, uh, I guess, like for, you know, grow, just, you know, having that experience with my dad and, and that being that sort of activity where other people, other kids play baseball and throw, you know, that kind of stuff with their dad. Like I played video games, right? And then, you know, that sort of sparked, started the conversation of, you know, what if this, uh, what if we change that? And it's just sort of started to get my head rolling about level design and game design and, you know, why certain things were laid out the way it was um, when, when I played games that were frustrating and things like that from way back when, right? And it allowed me to understand, learn a little bit more about the rules for how, why, how things are laid out and what they were meant to do, right? So, um, and then, so, you know, it just, it just that sort of psychological thing, aspect of game design that I started to fall into really slowly. And um, yeah, and I've been sort of really in love with games ever since, right? Um, so it's really under trying to sculpt, like the, the thing is like trying, really trying to sculpt something um, to motivate players um, to, to experience, you know, what you want them to experience, right? Uh, I think is really cool, really magical, right? And if it, when it works out exactly how you planned it, right? <laughs> Usually it never does, but, um, no. you know, through, through tuning and stuff, eventually it does get there. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Oh, mate, awesome. And I guess my kind of final question is for the students or, you know, aspiring level designers and designers, do you have any like tips for them or some kind of words to, to help them that might help them improve their own work? Yeah, I would say, um, you know, there are a lot of standards, like the standard way of doing things um, in this industry. Um, I would say always challenge the standard, right? Um, you know, just break the norm, right? Um, and create, try to create things that um, even if just challenge your regular way of thinking. And, and, and because uh, uh, sometimes, once in a while, you'll notice, you'll, you'll figure out that actually leads to something really interesting, a different kind of experience. Um, you know, there, there, there's all sorts of rules in terms of, especially with level design, how you should be creating levels, right? But always ask the question, why? Why does it have to be that way, right? Um, can you mix it up with, you know, other kind of variations and play a lot of games, a lot of other games and mix mechanics and see like, and then just sort of imagine in your head and, and then see maybe if you mix um, random stuff like that, like almost like food in a way where we, where you mix a bunch of ingredients where, you know, it, it seems like it'll taste really bad. You might be pleasantly surprised, right? <laughs> um, you know, by what you end up. So, you know, I would say definitely like experiment, don't settle for um, just the norm of, you know, the rule sets of what something should be, because I would say I, I, I'm not the conventional rule set follower. Like, I don't follow those kind of rule sets. Like, uh, unless, you know, it makes sense. Like understand why it does what it is, why the rules were created, right? And if you, the more you understand it, um, the more you understand where you can sort of bend it. Absolutely awesome. Well, mate, it's been an absolute pleasure having you on the show and just thank you so much for your time, mate. And for those who may want to reach out and get in contact with you, how can they do so, buddy? Yeah, my email is like jasonlee dot at pixomatic.com. Um, and yeah, if you want to know more about Infinite Fleet, um, you can check out our website at www.infinitefleet.com. Um, and uh, some of the something unique that uh, we're doing is the way we're sort of uh, raising funds and, um, you know, uh, 
and for people that want to invest, a lot of like, um, what was that? Um, startups, when they uh, raise funds for the game, um, you know, you buy digital items, right, for the game, and you're really just donating to the company. But what we're doing is um, we're raising funds through something called a security token, right? And um, it's basically like, um, you know, buying shares of the company, right? And uh, through shares, you also, you get digital items, your spaceship and, you know, everything you need to play in the game. You get invited to the alpha. But at the same time, you own a share of the company. So when the company uh, makes profit, you get dividends um, and you own shares. So, you know, those shares you can sell like any other shares, like Amazon shares and stuff, right? So, yeah, you're not just donating, you're investing. Uh, you become an investor of uh, Pixomatic. So to, to, to get into that, yeah, yeah, you can check out www.stoker.io. That's S-T-O-K-R.io. Uh, and fundraising is still happening there. Awesome. I'll put down a link in the description to all of those that Jason mentioned. So if you are interested, just follow them down below. Easy access for everyone there. So thank you again, mate, for joining me. If you want to reach out to me, you can do so on Twitter, which is at Max Pairs. If you want to email into the show with any questions, then please send them through to leveldesignlobby at gmail.com. Thank you all for listening. We've had a blast. We hope you have too. And we will catch you all next time. <laughs>